Hi everyone, I hope everybody is doing well and I hope everybody is going through the regularly posted YouTube videos of the Gate Academy Private Limited and uh, gaining good amount of knowledge. I am sure that you are getting a uh, best way of uh, uh, understanding concepts through our videos. So again, we are back with a, another video which is on the subject of machine design. So uh, let me introduce myself once again. So myself Prasanna Kumar from the Gate Academy Private Limited. So I am an alumni of IIT BHU Varanasi. So I did my bachelor's and master's both from IIT BHU Varanasi. So today in this lecture I would like to explain to you regarding eccentrical loading of rivets or bolts. I will draw the diagram first to understand what exactly is the eccentrical loading. This is one member this is another member both are attached with uh, some rivets like this or some bolts now a force is applied like this P the centroid of the arrangement is somewhere else here now this force P is not passing through or the line of action of force P is not passing through centroid of the arrangement of the rivets or bolts. So this is the centroid here, this point. So it is not passing through the centroid of the arrangement of the rivets or bolts here. It is passing a little bit eccentrically. So when it is passing eccentrically, the effects of the loads are different as compared to the effects which were supposed to be there if the line of action of the force is passing through the centroid here. Let's see the effect of this force P by transferring the load P from here to this point here. I'm putting equal and opposite force here. So to transfer the load, I'm putting P upward here, P downward here. So let's take this distance or this eccentrical distance as E. Now here you see that this particular upward force and this downward force both are making a couple of magnitude P into E. So and that couple's direction is clockwise. So we see that the effect of force P on the centroid of the arrangement of the rivets is actually given by a direct force P and a clockwise moment given by P into E. So what you're going to do is we're going to see the effect of this force P which is passing through centroid and a clockwise moment P into E here. Okay, so one thing is obvious that as this force P is passing through centroid, so this will be equally distributed on each and every rivet. And uh, later, in the same way, we're going to see the effect of this uh, clockwise moment P on each and every rivet. So I'm drawing the four rivets here and I will give the numbering to them. One, two, three, four. So this is centroid here. Here there is no compulsion that uh, all the rivets should be on the four corners of a square itself. So here I am showing you for square here, they are on the four corners of a square. So we can have a situation where uh, rivets are arranged in any particular fashion. Simply we have to find out the centroid and we have to do this analysis here, that's it. So the effect of this force P on each and every rivet, I am giving a number like this, 1, 2, 3, 4. The effect of each, the effect of the force P on each and every rivet will be in the same direction parallel to area of cross section of the rivets. So we will be having P1 dash, P2 dash, P3 dash, P4 dash. I am putting it as dash because uh, later the forces corresponding to moment will be denoted by double dash here. Okay. So these forces P1 dash, P2 dash, P3 dash, P4 dash are produced because of a force. That means input is the force and output is the force here. So we call them as direct forces or primary forces. Okay. So I am writing the rotation here. So P I dash is called as direct or primary shear force. I am calling it as shear force because it is acting parallel to area of cross of the rivets. So if it is acting perpendicular to area of cross of the rivet, I would be calling it as tensile force. Okay. Now we have to see the effect of the moment PE. That means input is the moment and we have to see the corresponding forces. Actually we have the concept of moment like this. 
So if some force is acting and perpendicular distance is R, so moment produced is R into F. This is the actual the formula here. So this R should be perpendicular to F. Now in this case what we are doing is taking the moment based upon direction of moment we are going to get the value of force F here or direction of the force F also here. So in this case F is giving rise to a moment which is in clockwise direction. So uh, in this case based upon clockwise direction that means if the moment is in clockwise direction what would be the value of the applied force or what would be the value what would be the direction of the uh, produced force there that's what you're going to find out so one thing oh, it is obvious on this condition is r will be perpendicular to f so first of all let's take this r so this is center of addition so if you join them you'll be getting r values so in this case all the distances are equal r1 r2 r3 r4 if you're going in some other fashion you'll be having some different values there so these forces, secondary forces or the forces produced because of the moment would be perpendicular to R1, R2, R3, R4 respectively. So I will write down or I will draw a perpendicular line like this. So first of all I am dropping the perpendicular here. Now we need to have secondary force to be perpendicular to R1 and create a clockwise moment. So to create a clockwise moment, the secondary forces P1 double dash P2 double dash. These are all should be in this particular fashion as shown in this diagram here. Then only we will be getting clockwise moment here. If P1 double dash is acting this direction, then we will be having anti-clockwise moment. So like that, whatever, I mean, if you are reversing the directions of secondary loads, we will be having anti-clockwise uh, anti moment there or anti-clockwise couple. We don't expect that to happen. So we expect to have clockwise couple here. So you got all the values here. Now let's take the angle between them. So you can take uh, the any angle here, lesser angle or higher value angle here. So this is let's denote it by theta one here. This is equal to theta two. This is equal to theta three. This is equal to theta four here. From geometry, you can say if all are lying on corners of a square. Then these values will be 135, 45, 45, 135 respectively. But anyways, we are giving a generalized uh, explanation here. So we are not concerned regarding exact values here. So we got all the things here. Now this secondary loads are also shear time because they are acting parallel to area of cross section of the rivets. So I am denoting in a general way here. PI double dash is actually called as indirect or secondary shear force. Indirect or secondary shear force. That is the value here. So we got all these things here. Now we see two forces are acting on each and every rivet. So if we are taking net, we can find the net force acting on each and every rivet here. So net force on i rivets, a general i rivet here. So P net on i rivet is equal to given by simply vector sum of both the forces P i dash square P i double dash square plus 2 P i dash P i double dash cos theta i. So P i double dash whole square plus 2 pa dash to pa double dash cos theta i here. So based upon the value of the primary force, secondary force theta, you will be getting net force here. Out of all these rivets, whichever is experiencing highest value of p net, so that is called as worst loaded rivet or bolt or it's also called as heavily loaded rivet. Worst loaded rivet or bolt or heavily loaded rivet here. So we will be getting like this. So in most of the questions that we are asking you to get the value of uh, worst loaded rivets, uh, that means identify the worst loaded rivet and find out the corresponding load on that. So we need to get P net here like this simply. So in this case, I didn't give you the values for P i dash P i double dash here. So simply remember like this. So P i dash is equal to simply given by P by n, where n is total number of rivets. And P i double dash is equal to P into E into R i whole by R1 square plus R2 square so on up to Rn square. So simply you have to evaluate R1, R2, R3, R4 and substitute the formula. We will be getting primary load, secondary load on respect to rivets. So get the values here. So we see that here the primary loads are same but secondary loads are depending upon Ri, the distance, the distance in the center. So whichever rivet is a little bit farther that will be a little bit having a probability that, that it can become heavily loaded rivet here. And also about theta. 
So as theta value is coming in such a way that uh, cos theta is becoming maximum, so that can also be adding or giving uh, a little bit probability that that derivative would be becoming higher lunar derivative or heavy lunar derivative here. So in the questions they'll be asking regarding that one, and based upon the net load, you can find out stress also. So as you got p net value, simply divide by area of cross from the derivative, so you'll be getting the value of stress induced inside the derivative. So if you are taking a heavily loaded derivative or highest or worst loaded derivative, then you'll be getting maximum value of shear stress induced inside the derivative material here. So out of the four derivative, whichever you're experiencing highest value of shear stress that is expressed by that value there. Now. But for every material, we have some value of strength of the material. The, that means the shear strength of the material will be some value there, experimental value there. So based upon shear strength of that particular rivet, we can understand what is the maximum load carrying capacity. Because P net highest or the worst loaded one can be related with the shear stress as pi d square by 4 into tau. So based upon strength value, we can get the value of P net and based upon P net, we can understand the value of P. So, we can design here in such a way that is we are designing designing means basically here based upon the shear strength of the rivet material we can say what should be the highest value of p the applied value of applied load p here so what should be the value of p so if the p is going beyond that particular value definitely the worst load rivet or one of the rivet will break and joint will be failing there so we don't expect that to happen so we can keep the value of p in below those limits there so this is how practically the uh, this particular uh, designing is done but in most of the gate questions you are concerned regarding either finding out primary loads, secondary loads, net loads or worst, uh, the load on the worst loaded rivet or finding out the stress on the worst loaded rivet. So these are all the things which you have to get here. So no matter what is the question, whether the question is from rivets or bolts, this is the way in which you have to solve it here. So there are different type of eccentrical loadings but this is the most famous eccentrical loading and Mechanical engineering people, so as the subject is of machine design subject here, mechanical engineering people in every gate examination, that means the past four to five years, we are observing that one question is compulsory from this type of eccentrical loading. So if you are clear with the concept, you can solve it very easily and you can get the answer very easily there. So based upon this concept, I can uh, I, I, I can give you guarantee that you can go through the previous gate questions and get the answers very easily. Simply, you must be a little bit careful regarding taking directions of secondary shear, uh, secondary shear loads here. If your directions are correct, automatically your answer will be correct here. Anywhere if you are doing or taking direction to be wrong, then you will be getting wrong answer there. So to get, take the correct direction, use right hand thumb rule. So right hand thumb rule simply, you put from center of the centroid along R1, then curl it in direction of force. So here the curling should be in clockwise, so P1 double L should be in that way. In the same way, like this. So we see, they should be acting in the way in which I have shown you in the diagram there. Then only you would be able to create this particular uh, uh, correct direction for the forces and you will be getting the correct answer for the uh, whatever they required in the question there. Thank you so much everyone. So you all go with all the previous gate questions. You can solve it and you'll understand uh, whatever the problem, uh, you can understand uh, the concept very thoroughly there. So if you're having any doubts, I guess you people are having the mail IDs of uh, the gate academy for, uh, for all the doubts, clarifications and all, you can send the mail and you can get them clarified there. Okay. Thanks so much everyone. All the best.